Hello, hello. Looks like looks like we're good. We're live. The live is happening. I'm gonna make sure that it's popping up on the uh, the old Facebooks. I know there's quite a there's sometimes a delay. So oh, I should mute the tab so that it doesn't echo. Yeah, there we go. It's about a one minute delay. There's about a one minute delay on these things. So uh, let's let's start doing the the usual, which is me uh, sharing as much as I can. I think I have a, a, a little bit of a better way of doing this there where it becomes a little bit more streamlined. I think I might not be successful, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and try it anyway uh, as you, you know we're gonna put it into some groups and hopefully we'll have a, a good bit of you guys uh, in the in the stream. I know it's Easter Sunday, so I'm not sure exactly how this will all be affected. If you do join, hit that share button, uh, share it out on your profile into some groups. The first couple minutes of this are always mildly awkward, and I appreciate your patience uh, during this awkward time that we that we're all going through. <laughs> uh, watching me share this out. Uh, to some groups that uh, that I know kind of sort of pay attention to what I do. Uh, but if you can hit that share button, that would be delightful and amazing. And I'll, I'll love you for it. Uh, and it'll just make things a little, little less awkward, I think, maybe. Or it'll make things more awkward. I don't know. But, but we'll find out. I'm going to get what, like two more, maybe two more groups to share it in and then the event. And, and then we'll be, we'll be off to the races. I think I got a fun little show for you guys planned. How's the Easter? How's the Easter? Is it, is it good? Is it a good, uh, good, good, good rabbit driven morning for everybody? Are you guys all feeling uh, the spirit of, of Easter, is that a thing? The spirit of Easter? <laughs> do people do that? Um, I don't know if they do or not, but figured I'd ask. Leave a comment if you want to tell me how your Easter <laughs> is going. Um, let's put this into the event. And boom, shared into the event. All right, now our final little bit of chicanery that needs to be taken care of is inviting a bunch of people. Hey, you guys could do that actually too, if you don't mind. Um, there's a little uh, thing at the top of these videos that lets you invite people to come watch the video and be a part of it. Uh, so if you would like to, you should totally invite some folks uh, that might enjoy the topics of conversation um, that uh, that we are going to take part in. Uh, so you know, uh, it'll be it'll be super super helpful to me um, in that regard. So if 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 you don't mind, hit hit those invites. Send out some invites to some folks. Um, as you can tell, I'm a one man operation. It's just me doing all this shit. Trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. Uh, not leaving out people that I know uh, <laughs> come and watch these live streams. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Uh, here we go. Got a few more people that I know tune into this and have left comments. Uh, and are sweet baby angel people. Thank you. 
Who else? All right. I think we're almost there. Cool. We'll be kicking this thing off in like a minute and a half to two minutes. Just get the last few people that I know uh, tune into this thing to be invited um, to come hang out with us. And uh, if you would like to hit that share button, tell some people. <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of you guys watching, a bunch of you guys, uh, in, in the stream. So, so let us, uh, let's get into this today. I'm going to hope that this works. Um, cause I have, I have, a a, a show planned for you guys that I think is going to be fun and interesting. Oh, let me do this. Uh, leave a comment. I'm going to put this in here so you guys can see how I'm going to kind of address comments throughout the live stream. If this is your first live stream, if this is not your first live stream, you know exactly what, uh, what's coming in. Um, we do this too. I, I have these fun banners that I like to use. Uh, so that that'll, that'll let you know that you can share it. So it's it's roughly about a minute behind. That's what the stream is. The stream's about a, a minute behind um, where I am. So uh, check this out. Here's 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 how the comments will work. Uh, when I when somebody posts a comment, I'll bring it up on the screen. Then we can kind of uh, read it together at the end of each segment, so that I don't lose my train of thought because I tend to. Uh, tend to do that. I tend to sometimes just uh, lose my train of thought in the middle of reading these comments. So I'm, I'm going to try not to to read uh, those comments um, while I'm talking and then kind of address them at the very end. Uh, I should also address the sunglasses. If you don't know, if you haven't uh, watched all the videos from this week, um, I have uh, I've been straining my eyes apparently a whole lot. Um, so that's kind of one of the side effects of it is like my eyes get super sensitive and then I was getting migraines and headaches on a daily basis, uh, neck pain. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I straight overstrained my eyes. I took Thursday off. It recovered pretty well. Uh, but I'm just kind of being a little bit more cautious since I'm, I'm staring at a screen, uh, probably, I don't know, two or three times more than I normally would. <laughs> I um, uh, I have to wear these sunglasses while I do my live streams because I also have a super bright light right here too, and that also affects um, affects the old eyeballs. So uh, we are we are ready to 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 rock and roll on on the on the live stream here. So let's uh, let's begin. Let's go to our first first thing. Um, I wanted to talk about the Gospel of St. Thomas because I don't think it's a gospel that is actually addressed by the church. Actually, I know it's not addressed by the church because it's not um, in, in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the books. Like, they don't, they don't have it uh, in the Jesus book, um, the Bible, some of you call it. I like to call it the Jesus book because there's so many different fucking versions of it. Um, but the uh, Council of Nicaea, I believe, did not include uh, the Gospel of St. Thomas. And uh, the gist of the Gospel of St. Thomas, if you don't know, is basically, uh, he basically says that you don't need to actually have like a church um, because you, wherever you are discussing God is is basically a church. So the fact that we're, we're even discussing um, the Gospel of St. Thomas on a live stream right now would technically be considered a church, uh, which makes me tax exempt, uh, which is which is pretty cool, which is pretty cool, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so St. Thomas, um, St. Thomas basically talks about, uh, you know, one of the things he mentions in in the Gospel is is that you don't need a church, you know, just discuss God, um, have discussions about what the meaning of the of the words are, and and there you go, that's a church. Um, and the Council of Nicaea 
uh, was like, you're a fucking idiot, Thomas. Okay, how are we going to exploit the shit out of poor people? How are we going to take their fears and exploit it for cash? How are we going to become a tax-exempt building uh, that doesn't allow homeless people uh, to sleep in these monoliths of, of religiosity? Okay, you're fucking dumb. Kill him. Kill. Get rid of this guy and bury those books in, in the deepest crevices of any ocean uh, that you can see, which at the time that the Council of Nicaea um, was was being formed was, I don't know, like, a, a, you know, like a, like a, like the, the deep end of a pool, maybe like they're, you know, they're, they're, they're they don't have submergible technology. But I wanted to kind of um, do a little bit, uh, a short reading from from that. Uh, it's, it's like there's like 114 passages or something. I was reading a, a, a uh, a majority of it. I got through about half of it. There's some weird shit in there. Uh, there's some like weird E.E. E. Cummings poetry type shit where, you know, he's just like, if your mother is your father, maybe they're the same two. And if there's two, then there's one. If there's one, then there's two. Then what does it make of you? And it's like this weird, like Dr. Seuss on acid. Like, it's just like, okay, we get it, Jesus. You were doing some party drugs and you said some shit and everybody was like, I guess we should write this down, right? Should we all write this down? What did you What did you eat? And it's like it doesn't matter. Just write everything I'm saying down. <laughs> you know? uh, but the the beginning portion of it is I feel like the the Council of Nicaea got to like the the first five lines of the Gospel of Saint Thomas and was just like we got to not put this. He's tell he's empowering poor people. He's empowering regular people. This is crazy. This guy is crazy. Uh, is there a way we can frame him? Uh, can we do the Judas thing where we just blame him for the de death of Jesus too? Can we just say that he also murdered Jesus and just like ignore him forever? Can we say that he's a prostitute like Mary and we shouldn't trust prostitutes? Can we do that? Is that something we can do? How could we make this guy look bad because he's not letting us make a profit off of people's belief systems and exploit fear? How can we make that happen? <laughs> so. Um, let me see if this works. Tell me if this works because I've never tried this piece of technology before, but I can share a screen. So here we go. Boom. There it is. That's the screen right there. Um, I hope you guys can see that, but I'm, I'm going, I'm only going to read the uh, passages two and three. We're not really going to go into all like the rest of it. Some of it just I, like I read through half of this stuff and some of it gets kind of weird. Um, so um, let's read two and three. I think these two kind of talk about what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, Jesus says, "The one who seeks should not see seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will be dismayed, and when he is dismayed, he will be astonished. And when he will be king over the all." Uh, Jesus says, "If those who lead you to, uh, if those who lead you to say to you, look." The kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fishes will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside you and outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will be known and you will realize that you are all the children of the living father. But you do not come to know yourselves, then you exist in poverty and you are poverty. Kablamo. Damn. Dropping some knowledge. Dropping some knowledge uh, that Jesus, you know, that's what he likes to do. He likes to drop that. He likes to drop that old knowledge. Uh, and so essentially um, what we read <laughs> from the Gospel of St. Thomas is that he's kind of, Jesus is telling you to be a critical thinker. Um that Jesus wants you to think for yourself. He wants you to discover who you are, right? And and by pointing out the fact that, um, you know, uh, if somebody says that the heaven is up there, it's in the sky, right? It's it's all the way up in the sky. Uh, well, the birds have found heaven before you did. If it's in the sea, the fish have already found heaven before before you did. Um, so maybe it's not there because they don't they don't you know they they seem to just be hanging out and enjoying enjoying wherever they are so maybe we that's what we should do 
is it's it, the kingdom of heaven is inside you and outside you. So it's, it's it's basically encouraging you to make this the kingdom of heaven. Do the best that you can to make this the kingdom of heaven. And that was dangerous talk, a uh, super dangerous talk, you know, um, because that's not what the church wants you to believe. The church wants you to believe that by giving 10% of your tithings, that's how you make it to the kingdom of God. That's how you find, you know, um, the, the true kingdom where Jesus is and the second coming and the whole golden gates and St. Peter is, you know, reading all of your sins to you or whatever the fuck it is. Um, and really what this, what the gospel of St. Thomas is even talking about is, uh, I mean, it's kind of an Eastern thing, right? It's a very like Eastern Buddhist -y, um, kind of a thing where, uh, where it's just like this world around us is really heaven. Uh, and that's what it should be. We should be making this world the best that it that that we we can be. We should be taking that responsibility to ourselves. And that's the other thing that that uh, the Gospel of St. Thomas kind of talks about is taking that responsibility on yourself. You know, you make this world uh, what you want this world to be. So if you want this world uh, to be this greed-driven, you know, let's chase profit all the time kind of thing, uh, then that's what this world will be. And is that heaven? It makes you ask that question. It makes you think about these things. Um, you know, is knowing your true self, knowing who you really are. Uh, that's the last part. It's the last part about that. Uh, you know, the, the, the passage there is, uh, if you do not come to know yourselves, then you exist in poverty and you are poverty. That's huge right there. You know, if you don't know who you really are, then you, then you are poverty. That's huge. So really, you are not a rich person until you figure out who you really are, until you figure out what you really love, what you really enjoy. Um, and I mean, again, that's self-exploration. That's that's finding your internal Zen, right? Which are kind of these Eastern ideologies um, that uh, that 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 isn't really preached over here. This because there is the pursuit of 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 giving yourself up to something higher, and you can give yourself up to something higher if you choose to. But really, the responsibility of um, making your life what you want it to is all up to you, not up to this sort of ethereal being in the sky kind of thing. Because again, the birds live in the sky and they would have probably seen some fucking robed dude being like, what, what is this guy doing here? Why is he here? You know, is he building a Starbucks? Fuck this guy. Fuck this guy. We don't need a Starbucks up here. We do just fine flying around, pooping on statues. We're doing just fine. The fish in the ocean know who they are. They're fishing the ocean and they're having a fucking great time just being fish in the ocean. So we should just have a great time, you know, being who we are. And that's part of the problem is I don't think uh, religion, religion, religion tells you that you should give yourself up to God and God will dictate your life to you. Um, you know, so, so there, it kind of takes this, this self determination away, this self agency away from you. It doesn't allow you to think critically. It just tells you that God said it this way and this is the way that it's gotta be. And, and we're done with it. Um, when really, there you go. There's an example of, um, you know, religious text right there. Although unofficial religious text, I have to say, um, that, that says something, um, quite the opposite, quite the opposite. You know, it, it, it encourages critical thought. It encourages you to do some self-exploration. Um, so, uh, you know, being that it is Easter, uh, being that it is in the vicinity of Easter, um, Perhaps that's what it's time for. You know, let's take this time to to look into ourselves to see how uh, who we really are, what we really enjoy to do, and go pursue that. So we don't live in poverty. We don't live in in the poverty of um, of discovering ourselves and discovering, uh, you know, what we're what we're capable of. Uh, and also, fuck the Council of Nice Nicaea. I feel like that needs to be said. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's head over to the to the to to the second story. The meat, the meat 
I like to call this the meat of the story. We're going to talk about the 1919 Boston police strike. Um, that's right. The, the police in Boston um, had a strike. This is the only police strike uh, in the history of possibly the world. I'm not sure, but, but America for sure. This is the only police strike that ever happened. Um, and we'll get into why. Let's get into to why. We have our handy dandy notes. Um, so this, this uh, if you guys remember, since we're talking about strikes a whole lot, I did a whole series on uh, a couple of different strikes that happened in 1919, right? Uh, first, the, the Seattle general strike happened in 1919 uh, in January, February. That only lasted about five days. Uh, we had a six-week strike in Winnipeg uh, that happened between May and June. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the beginning of that was moral defeat. Then uh, the moral defeat didn't work in Winnipeg, so they just resorted to violence. Um, and, uh, and that kind of squashed that general strike. But it did, it did help them get closer to collective bargaining. Um, and so we arrive here in Boston. Um, after, after the Seattle general strike, after the Winnipeg general strike, where this is all kind of moving a little bit more East, right? Um, so the, all, all of a sudden a bunch more strikes are starting to pop up in Boston, right? You had, um, textile workers, phone operators, railway workers, uh, they all started striking and, and a bunch of them started winning. A bunch of them started, uh, you know, they were, they were, uh, striking so hard that they actually, uh, started to win and they were actually doing better for themselves. They were getting the pay increases that they wanted to, they were getting um, better work conditions uh, that they wanted to uh, except for the Boston police uh, and the Boston police uh, were in the city of Boston in 1919 were some of the lowest paid workers uh, that year and inflation was going up because this was also, you know, uh, coming out of the heels of world war one um, and, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of inflation, but no, nobody was getting a pay increase, um, because of that. So, so rents were going up, costs of everything were going up. Um, and you know, the Boston police remained to be some of the lowest paid people in the city of Boston. So they were making $1,400 a year. $1,400 a year, which equates to roughly $23,600 a year today. So somebody making like an annual salary of $23,600. The first graphic design job I ever got was in 2011. And um, I was paid uh, to begin with $20,000 a year. And then um, six months later, $25,000 a year. And then when I got a raise, I went from $25,000 to $25,000, uh, $25,200. I got a $200, uh, annual pay increase, uh, which was all terrible. Like I wish I would have been a little bit more, um, knowledgeable about unions and strikes and things of that sort. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, these guys are being paid less than that. These guys are being, these guys were being paid less than an entry level graphic designer, um, today. So, and, and they were, and, and the work conditions were significantly worse, uh, than, than the work conditions that I was in, um, at that time, right. They were working 72 to 98 hours in a week. Uh, that's over four days. So it, you know, if you're looking at a seven day, uh, work week, they were virtually working a little over four days sometimes, um, out of the week, just straight through. Right. Um, they would get one day off every other day of the week, um, or one day off every other week. Sorry. Uh, jumble that up a little bit. Uh, and in, in, and on that day off, let's say they wanted to go to like New Hampshire or they wanted to go to Vermont or something, they would have to get special permission from the commissioner, um, to approve their leave, to approve them leaving. Right. And, uh, they also lived in the station in terrible unsanitary conditions. Like it was just a bunch of dudes sleeping in one room, sharing one bathroom, um, you know, so they were just living in like piss poor conditions, not being paid a whole lot, being completely overworked. Um, 
and they were kind of being treated like like a really shitty version of the military, right? This was like the this this was like the short end of the stick when it comes to militarizing the police. Um, so the the commissioner, the mayor, and the governor of Massachusetts were all against uh, unionizing the police force, and all three of them kind of gave the same kind of rhetoric, right? They all kind of gave the same rhetoric of. Um, well, this is Bolshevism. This is communism. This is the Russian Revolution coming to our doorstep. Um, this is people uh, trying to take down American capitalism, take your freedoms away. Uh, you know, this is a, and they and they went into like the xenophobic racist attack of like, oh, all these foreigners are influencing our police. They're making um, they're making everybody look bad. Uh, they're making all the police look like a bunch of assholes and they're they're making the police turn against American capitalism, you know. So all of this sort of propaganda was coming out of uh, the commissioner, the mayor and the governor's office uh, against the police saying that we want to unionize so we can we can be at the negotiating table and negotiate for something better, negotiate for better work conditions, negotiate for better pay because we're working long hours, we're protecting the city of Boston, we're overworked, we're underpaid, we're exhausted. Um, and, um, you know, um, what are we going to do? Like, uh, we, we want to unionize and we want to get together and, uh, um, you know, uh, push forward and, and, the, and the mayor and the commissioner and the governor were like, no, you can't do that because uh, Russia. Right. Um, which is very similar to today is anytime that, that anybody says anything uh, oppositional to the um, to the mainstream conversation, to the establishment conversation, um, you know, they they kind of put it to this red scare tactic. And initially, you would think that the red scare tactic goes uh, back into the 50s and 60s with the McCarthyism and everything. But it really goes even further than that. Um, really we're seeing the red scare tactic being used in the late 1800s to early 1900s really pushing into the early 1900s um and the boston police did have some kind of a a union they had a boston social club uh which wasn't really a union it did allow them to organize together and discuss issues that they had but that's really about it that's really about it you know they um they they got together and they would discuss the problems that they were having within the thing, but they weren't able to come up with any viable solutions. They weren't able to come to the negotiating table um, and and collectively bargain. And this was before I I, I think this was really before collective bargaining became like a, a big part of the um, of, of the union nomenclature. Um, I might be wrong about this, uh, and if I am, leave a comment. Um, but I believe that collective bargaining really became part of the bigger conversation when it came to unions and the labor movement in like maybe the thirties. That's when they were, that's when they were uh, legitimized by the establishment, let's call it, um, you know, like the general strike of 1934 in San Francisco uh, that brought collective bargaining to the forefront of that conversation. Whereas right now in 1919, that's not really happening a whole lot. They're not really, um, saying that unions are, are legitimate still. So um, the commissioner, uh, well, especially the mayor and the governor were saying that uh, the police can't form a union because they're not quote unquote employees. Uh, they are state officers. And then commissioner Curtis um, basically like gave the stamp of approval and he said yes they're not employees they're state officers uh so they can't unionize they have to do what the state tells them to do um and there's something specifically that the the commissioner said um we'll go to the screen share thing here that i want to read to you guys uh this was a quote uh that that commissioner curtis said he uh he said it is or should be apparent to any thinking person that the police department of this and any other city cannot fulfill its duty to the entire public if its mem members are subject to the direction of an organization existing outside the department. 
if troubles and disturbances arise where the interests of this organization and the interests of other elements and classes in the community conflict the situation immediately arises, which always arises when a man attempts to serve two masters. He must either fail his duty as a policeman or in his obligation to the organization that controls him. Uh, we're kind of talking about them being obligated to the to the unions is basically what they're saying. Um, he they would be they would be obligated to the unions and people in general. And uh, and Commissioner Curtis sees that being a problem because you can't be, uh, you, you know, you can't be um, obliged to the public and to the unions. Uh, and I would say that they kind of are doing this in a different sense. Right. Uh, they're, they're kind of doing this in a different sense, because right now uh, in our society, we see the police being used as a private military force to protect corporations. We saw that in North Dakota. We see that in New Orleans. We see that anywhere where there is a pipeline, anywhere where there's fossil fuel protests, um, cops get called uh, to protect the interests of a corporation rather than the interests of the people. Uh, so it is the people's right to peaceably assemble. It is the people's right to protest something um, and corporations being linked directly to the government uh, under Citizens United, basically giving corporations the ability to pay into the government to legislate on their behalf means that the, the, the cops are now being used to protect corporations, which means that they're serving two masters. They should be serving the public. But now they're serving the corporations because they're being paid by the government who's being paid by the corporations. So, you know, this is just transitive property. So what Commissioner Curtis is saying is actually in in application today. Um, the unions, in my opinion, the unions would be um, or should be in theory. Um, and I think in practice, in, in certain cases, uh, to people like they're they're an organization that brings the working class into the into the negotiating table and so they would be represented by people like it's people representing people kind of thing um so the police force being unionized and serving the union would de facto be serving the public in and of itself being that the union is 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 comprised of people right like that's sort of the argument that i would make um to go against commissioner curtis's point uh that you're serving two masters and you can't have a police union that serves the general public and uh, has the interests of the unions in mind so i think i think he's wrong now throughout all this while while commissioner curtis is making these statements the mayor the mayor of boston was on an extended vacation oh la dee da huh fucking cops have to buy their own uniforms too, by the way. That was another thing. The cops in, in Boston had to purchase their own uniform, uh, which was, which, um, uh, because they should have multiple uniforms. Um, they spent like 200 bucks a year on uniforms. Uh, so, you know, uh, kind of, um, kind of, kind of shitty thing to do. But so while the cops are struggling there and they're overworked, the mayor's are like, I'm going to take another week off. I've earned it. I've earned this week off. You know, I'm going to be in Rhode Island for a bit. I'm going to be fishing. Uh, I might go. I might go look for some whales. Um, so <laughs> while well, all this shit's going on, the, the mayor's just like, maybe I'll go to Vermont. You know, <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe I'll go look for some moose in the woods. I don't know. Seems like the right thing to do. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, governor Calvin Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge is the governor of Massachusetts at this point, um, who later becomes president. We'll get into that in a second. Governor Coolidge's attorney general, um, claims that, uh, the police, if the police unionize, then, uh, they, they would have the government by the throat. He, he says that uh, he says that the police has them uh, by the throat for wanting wanting to unionize, saying that uh, they need to unionize to better serve the public. So they're 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 choking them. They're choking them to for, for their basic human rights, <laughs> which is like, what the fuck? it's like you're asking me to treat you 
like a real human being so that you can do your job more effectively and protect the public without being overworked, exhausted, and being paid properly. And you are choking us, but you are torturing us. You are taking the air out of our lungs. How dare you, you insensitive bastards. <laughs> this, is, this is how sociopaths talk. This is how sociopaths talk. Human rights is a threat of violence for sociopaths. That's what it is. So um, while all this negotiating is happening throughout the, the springtime, right? Winnipeg is, is striking at this point. General strikes going on. Um, while that's happening, the mayor of Boston extended vacation. The attorney general is saying that asking for unions is choking them out. Uh, we arrive at August, on August 20th, 1919, uh, eight lead union organizations, union organizers uh, from the police. The police do organize and create a union for themselves. Uh, they all get suspended. All eight of the organizers get suspended. And, uh, and the 11 people that supported um, the, the union organizers also get suspended. They also get suspended from it. So... Uh, the American Labor Federation, the uh, the or the American Federation of Labor (AFL), uh, I wrote it wrong in my notes here. Uh, tried to step in, right? They they were like, "We'll represent the unions. We'll 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 absorb. We'll we'll make the police union a part of the AFL." Um, and Commissioner Curtis and, and the mayor said that no, um, we don't we don't recognize the police union, especially if they join the AFL. Uh, we're not going to recognize them. We think that they should be independent. Um, and then they offered them like a small, tiny raise. Um, and, uh, and then the government, uh, the, the governor also did the same thing. They also offered a small, tiny raise. Um, and the reason why they even conceded to offering them a small, tiny raise is, is there was some banker uh, that, was, that was like, hey, I support the police union. Um, I think we, the police should be unionized. I think we should be talking to them um, about paying them better. Uh, we should be giving, you know, we should be trying to figure out how the government can pay for the uniforms. Um, and, and we should be talking about, um, you know, better hours, better living conditions for them, uh, because they are protecting our public. They are doing a, a public service for us. They are putting their lives on the line. So this rich banker comes out on their side. And all of a sudden they go, well, we should probably give them something. So they give them these pittance and they do this twice. Um, and it should also be noted that there are five newspapers in Boston um, and four out of five of them are for the police union. They do, they do support the police union. So there, so in the beginning, there seems to be a lot of support for the police to unionize the bankers supporting them. Four out of five of the newspapers are supporting them. They're saying that this is the right thing to do. Um, that, you know, they, they should be protected. Um, and Governor Coolidge and Mayor Peters, um, that's the, the mayor's name, basically were like, we'll give you a pittance. Is this pittance okay? And the police union goes, no, we also don't want to be independent. We might, we might go and join the AFL because the AFL seems to be taking us more seriously than you guys are. And we want to be at the negotiating table. We deserve to be treated better. Um, so eventually... On September 8th, uh, the 1,136 members of the police union voted for a strike. Uh, 1,134 of the members voted for the strike. Uh, two voted against it. So, I mean, this was virtually unanimous at this point. Like, basically everybody wanted uh, to, to strike because they thought that this was the right direction to go. And then on September 9th, at 5.45 p.m., uh, the Boston police went on strike. They just went on strike. And um, that happened when 72% of the police force didn't show up to work, right? They just didn't show up to work. Um, and so Governor Coolidge was like, well, we got to fucking do something. This is kind of crazy. So he calls in 100 Metropolitan Park police and then 58 of them refused to participate. They, they also joined in solidarity with the strikers. And so, so those 58 that joined the strikers got suspended, right? And, and now it's like um, there, there's less than, you know, uh, so what, what is that? 42. There's 42 Metropolitan Park Police. And um, 
handful of Boston police that are trying to, you know, enforce law and order throughout the entire city of Boston in 1919. Um, so, uh, Governor Coolidge is freaking out. Mayor Peters is freaking out. Uh, Commissioner Curtis is freaking out because they're like, what the fuck do we do? And it turns out the establishment, not so great at organizing. Not so great at coming up with plans. <laughs> Maybe um, if the government understood how union organizers did their jobs, they would be able to organize a little bit better. <laughs> so... Uh, the evening of September 9th, the entire city of Boston is virtually left unprotected, right? Virtually left, uh, unprotected. And, uh, people start to kind of get a little nervous. Uh, September 10th, um, the propaganda starts hitting in, in full gear because all the papers, remember these papers, four out of five of them supported them. Uh, now all the papers that supported them are reporting things like uh, the strikers are deserters and they are agents of Lenin. I mean, this would be like today's equivalent of calling somebody like a Putin puppet because you don't agree with what they're saying or because they're like, hey, um, I think this presidential candidate is a sexual assaulter and here's some proof. And they're like, Putin puppet. Uh, and you're like, hey, I think this super rich guy um, that has these insane sort of fetishy corporate uh, rules and also owns a newspaper, a cybersecurity company, CIA contracts, and a grocery store um, is a sociopath that needs to treat his employees better. And you're like, ah, Putin puppet. You know, like that's basically the equivalent of, of what's going on here. He called them deserters, essentially traitors to the country um, for asking to be treated better, um, you know, and... Um, so by September 10th, the evening of September 10th, during the daytime, everything was fine. The evening of September 10th, one day after the strike begins, uh, the city just erupts into chaos, right? Like people realize that the cops aren't around and they just start looting. There's like hooliganism. People are like gambling on the streets. There's prostitution everywhere. It's just like mayhem all over the place, right? <laughs> and... Uh, so like the governor's like freaking out. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. Uh, he gets like Harvard kids. This is the same thing that happened in 1919 too, by the way. It's like the minus the hooliganism. Uh, the, the 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 Seattle 1919 strike did not really turn violent. Um, but uh, Oli Hansen, who was the the mayor of Seattle, who's who's like praised for his his uh, his actions at this point. Um, gave deputized a bunch of like university kids. So that's what Mayor Peters does. <laughs> and Governor Coolidge does is they deputize a bunch of Harvard kids. And they were like, hey, you guys seem fine. You guys could have some guns. Go have a good time. Uh the the state guard gets called. The Massachusetts State Guard gets called uh, because they're freaking out. And really the height of the violence uh, ends up in, in a place called Scully Square. I think I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, uh, is Scully Square, where um, the state guard and the, um, the basically killed uh, eight, eight civilians. And it was basically like any law that they were breaking, like if they were gambling, they just fired on them. Like you are, uh, you're breaking and entering into a store, kablamo, you're dead. Um, and all of the people that were doing this were like kids, right? They were like between the ages of like 20 and 25. They were just kids being fucking dumb kids because they're like, oh, well, cops don't exist. We could do whatever the fuck we want. Freedom, you know, like this, which is like human behavior, you know, like, like, you know what happened? Like the first time your parents are like, we're going to leave you alone in the house. Here's $40 for the pizza. And you're just like, let's bring everybody. How much cocaine can $40 get me? And then, you know, like your house erupts into flames. And your parents are like, well, we obviously can't leave you alone um, in the house uh, by yourself. Uh, also, how did this cocaine get here? And, you know, like that's that's kind of what what's happening. Um, and had you let people kind of just. I'm not I don't I don't know if this is the right way to go about doing this, but like had you just kind of let them loot and riot for like a day. I bet the following day they would have been like, oh, this doesn't seem like it's very productive. 
you know, like in like two or three days, it would have been like, I think I'm bored of just gambling and fucking in the streets constantly. I kind of, maybe I should help <laughs> help my fellow man out. Uh, and, and, and like people would have determined their own law and order. They would have just figured it out themselves. Um, but instead, um, you know, eight people got shot and killed. Uh, a bunch were wounded. Um, and then I think there were two or th two or three deaths um, that came from like citizens firing upon themselves. Uh, so like, you know, like a looter would come into a store and uh, the store owner would shoot them and kill them. Like there was one particular case where like a 20 year old kid was breaking into uh, like a mechanic shop or something and he broke in and the owner was there and, and the owner shot him and, and, you know, so, so this was uh, this was like, you know, the height of the violence. It, it's the first night. Um, chaos is broken loose. The state guard is called a uh, Harvard kids are fucking, you know, deputized. And uh, and within that night, they do um, uh, roughly thirty five thousand dollars in damages, which if you translate it to today uh, was five hundred ninety one thousand dollars in damages. That's a lot of fucking money. So, so basically, the entire city sued the city. It's the the. Um, how do I want to to phrase this? Uh, the the citizens and business owners of the city uh, sued the city of Boston itself for these damages. Um, and I think I think the city of Boston paid back like thirty four thousand uh, dollars out of thirty five thousand um, dollars in damages. So. Around September 11th and September 12th, in, in the frame of those two days, uh, the AFL wanted to call, uh, call a general strike, but they didn't. They were kind of reluctant, and they went back and forth, and they were like, eh, we, sh we should, because it seems like it's the right thing to do. You know, it'll shut down the city, kind of like what happened in Seattle, kind of like what happened in Winnipeg. But man, with this this thing because it was particularly cops, we this thing escalated so quickly. Um, it's going to really seem like uh, we're calling for more violence with this general strike, uh, and we're going to get bad press. And it basically ended uh, with the AFL on September twelfth uh, asking all of the workers to just return. Um, the fifteen hundred police that that went on strike over the course of, what was it, four days, um, were replaced. They got fired. And uh, um, they were replaced with 1,100 out-of-work veterans from World War One. And then here's the bullshit of it all, right? This is the bullshit of it all. The 1,100 1 veterans that were hired um, were paid better, were given a better living conditions, were given bigger pensions, um, and, and they were, um, you know, uh, they were just given, basically they met the demands that the police were asking for and they just gave it to replacement workers, which just shows me that like, this is more of an action of callous than it was anything else. Like it was, it like, it, it just shows that governor Coolidge, mayor Peters and commissioner Curtis are more callous individuals than they are anything else. This was a big fuck you to the strikers. This was a big fuck you to say, how dare you ask us for, um, to, to, to treat you like, like you're, you know, regular people, like to give you basic human rights. How dare you ask us that? You know what? We're going to give these other people that, you know why? Cause they didn't ask it from us. And, and we're, and it was just a big fuck you to them because at this point, it basically proves that um, that the city and the government had the money to do this. They had the money to give them the raise. They had the money to treat them a little bit better. And they had the money to probably hire uh, more cops so that they were working less hours, so that there was more, you know, patrolmen on the beats. Uh, and, and it gives an opportunity where you have this huge unemployment gap that a bunch of veterans could have been hired to, to help the police force. Um, so it shows that there was an infrastructure in place, but there was a reluctancy by Governor Coolidge, by Mayor Peters, and Commissioner Curtis to do this. And it shows the cops that if you go against the establishment, if you go against the masters, which the masters were um, Commissioner Curtis and Mayor Peters, specifically for the city of Boston, because 
part of this thing was Mayor Peters felt like he didn't have control over the cops, right? Um, they, he was just like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm completely connected with the cops. So he basically, um, you know, had to buddy buddy with the commissioner and he did. And the commissioner and the mayor kind of teamed up together and they, and they fucked over these working cops, these blue collar police officers. So this is what the establishment does when the, the police go against them, when the police sit there and say, well, what you're doing isn't right. They treat them, uh, like secondhand citizens. They, they, they run a bunch of smear campaigns against them where the papers are calling them deserters and agents of Lenin, whatever the, which, which is like, what does that mean? That means that what they're, they're a bunch of people that are asking for working class rights. They're, they're standing up for, for the, for, for their actual basic human rights that and so, so they're agents of somebody now, like, you know, so. It just means that the, these these people in the, in in the government top down are just callous fucking people. That's all that means. So they still had to these these um, eleven hundred um, veterans that became cops still had to go get their own uniforms because the state and the city wasn't going to help them out and provide them with 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 uniforms and the united garment workers refused to make these people uniforms because they were standing in solidarity with the 1500 cops that uh that went on strike right <laughs> um so these cops had to report in civilian clothing because they just <laughs> like they didn't have a uniform to report in so this was all um, September, October, uh, and by December 21st, 1919, the State Guard was relieved of duty uh, because they finally got the numbers of cops up, which, again, same thing, right? Like, they had the opportunity to give the cops a, a appropriate pay raise. They had the opportunity of hiring more police officers um, to help reduce the number of hours these cops have to work. Uh, and improve the conditions and give them a better pension. And if the idea is that these cops are meant to serve the public, to keep the law and order in place, why would you not help them do that by reducing, you know, um, exhaustion, by reducing the stresses that they already have to face, right? Isn't that the logical thing to do? And instead, Governor Coolidge was like, "No, no, no! Asking for that. If you want to, if you want to reduce stress, if you want to have like basic human rights, that's communism, and that goes against freedom. What freedom is is having less, uh, f less money for like way more work. That's freedom. You guys don't get it because you guys are like poor and stupid. I'm rich, so uh, obviously super smart, uh, and that's how they treated these cops." So the media reaction after all this was largely negative. Um, huge, largely negative. I'm going to make sure I find the right quote here uh, from, from old Coolidge, if I can find it. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Governor Coolidge, oh boy, Governor Coolidge, um, said that a uh this is a democrat by the way or, or i'm sorry this is not governor coolidge i made a mistake here uh this is democrat woodrow wilson this is the president the president of the united states is making this statement uh about cops trying to unionize right he basically said that any cop that tries to unionize is committing a crime against civilization that's what they think about cops unionizing to be at the negotiating table so that working class police officers that are meant to protect the public that are asking for better work conditions and better compensation for the amount of work that they do for the stress that they have to go through so they can better do that job and and actually better serve the public are committing a crime against civilization i mean you know you don't get that kind of bold leadership everywhere and by the way i wrote bold leadership and then i uh, I, I drew a penis because that's what i think of uh, woodrow wilson uh, I think that he's sort of a, a limp, drippy penis. That's what I think about him. Um, but <laughs> here's here's the direct quote that I want to read for you guys. Uh, this is actually from Coolidge. 
that's why I got confused because I pulled up the Coolidge quote, uh, and I, and before that I, I had the uh, Woodrow Wilson thing in my notes. But this is Coolidge, right? Coolidge called them deserters. He called them traitors. Um, and uh, he this is he said uh, when we were uh, or I'm sorry, what is this? Uh, this is the response that uh, the, the I think the Union people made. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is a response that the union people made. Sorry about the little bit of a disorganization on this part. This is like new technology. So I'm kind of trying to figure out how to coordinate my notes and this thing together. Uh, it said, when we were honorably discharged from the United States Army, we were hailed as heroes, saviors of this country. We returned to our duties on the police force of Boston. Now, through only a few months, uh, now only a few months have passed. We were denounced as deserters, as traitors to our city and violators of our oath of office. The first men to raise the cry were those who have always opposed to giving uh, to labor a living wage. It has taken up by the newspapers who cared little for real facts. You finally added your word of condemnation. Among us men who have gone against spinning machine guns single-handed and captured them volunteering for the job, among us are men who have ridden with dispatches through shell fire so dense that four men fell and only the fifth got through. Not one man of us ever disgraced the flag of a service. It is bitter to come home and to be called deserters and traitors. We are the same men who were on the, on the French front. Some of us fought in the Spanish War of 1898. Won't you tell the people of Massachusetts in which war you served, right? And, and here's the other thing. He, this is called out a, a really big thing, which is, um, which is that the working class man goes and fights for rich people's wars. They were basically like, what war did you serve in Governor Coolidge that you get to call us deserters and traitors when we fucking upheld the flag, when we were out there taking mortar fire? Which war were you in? Where were you at? Were you serving cushy in a fucking Senate job? Were you fucking... Uh, budding up to 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 railway bosses, and they call out the media for lying too. The media, which was in support of the union before the strike, when they were trying to negotiate, they were in support of them. And then all of a sudden, the banker disappeared. Right, the banker was like, "Oh shit, they're striking. I better shut the fuck up." And you didn't hear from this banker ever again. You didn't hear from this banker about any of this shit. So the newspapers did what they normally do, which is they tow the line of the establishment. They tow the line uh, of, of the government in place. And they lied about them, calling them traitors and deserters and all these names, right? Agents of Lenin, the Bolsheviks, and all this other shit. And they called them out. They called out Governor Coolidge. Um, the... The unfortunate thing about them calling out Governor Coolidge as they did in in this where where am I? Yep, this one it's right here. <laughs> um, is it as unfortunately it didn't work? He still he still became uh, the 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 president uh, after after all of this, right? But but it's not just Woodrow Wilson. It's not just Governor Coolidge that's shitting. On the on the police union, that's 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 shitting on on people that are trying to like stand up for their rights, to stand up on the rights that they actually went and fought for, that they almost fucking died for, right? Uh, Senator Henry Cabot uh, looked at the uh, looked at all this, and he basically said that the AFL controlling the police would mean that it's communism, that that if a union represented, that if the police union joined the AFL, that they would be giving to communism. Because essentially that, once again, the logic would be that the police would actually be serving the people. They would be represented by working class people coming together, adding their names to the negotiating table. So when the government decides to change laws and um, to, to be like the union would be a checks and balances system. So if the legislative body is making, um, you know, legislative body and judicial body, they, they're making laws and upholding laws that. Uh, are, are in no benefit to the working class person. The unions come in and they become the checks and balance system represented by the working class themselves and not somebody in a managerial position, not somebody in some sort of like higher up position um, and saying, well, this is unfair and here's why. And we deserve to be at the negotiating table. We deserve to have our voice represented when you're making decisions that affect our lives. Um, and that's apparently uh, communism 
and it's bad. It's a bad thing. If that's communism, fine, but it's not. Um, you know, so instead, you know, the senator is like, oh, we what well, we should have though is cops that listen to the government that uh, that are basically um, that are basically used as sort of this private authoritarian force of the government that if the government makes a law no matter how ridiculous over the top or corporate friendly it is and how it fucks over the common man uh cops should just enforce it with whatever force we deem them to so what they're accusing them uh what they're actually accusing them th th of, of that they would do if they were part of a union is what they want them to do as part of a government force that's what the senator is essentially advocating for. And that's kind of what the cops have become. Like we talked about earlier, right? Like they represent pipelines more than they represent people. Now, we did have a couple of Standing Rock cops uh, join in solidarity with the protesters there, but uh, I think it was about two of them. And um, and we talked about that in a in an earlier uh, stream, right? Um, you know, the cops now are basically used as uh, as a private army to protect your fallacies. I'm using the fallacies as a ph, like a like a dick. Just in case, if anybody uh, missed the joke, <laughs> the Ohio State Journal um, wrote a piece where they said that uh, they should revoke citizenship from any uh, any striking cops. That if you go on strike, you should have your citizenship revoked from you. That's that's insanity. I mean, that's authoritarian. All of this stuff is authoritarian. Um, and that's really what this is the sound of, right? Um, crime, you, have, you have the Democrat, you have a Democrat who's the president at the time uh, saying that this is a crime against civilization. You have a Republican governor um, who is calling them deserters, traitors, and agents of Lenin. You have a senator um, saying that uh, it, this would be the downfall of freedom and, and you know, it's, it's capitalism. You have, you have a newspaper uh, saying that you should revoke citizenship from striking cops. This is all the sound of capitalist corporate authoritarianism. And, and this is all still in effect today. Because if you go and stand up for the working class, all of these things are levied against you. All of these things are levied against you. What do they do to Bernie Sanders, right? What do they do to anybody that, that stands alongside Bernie Sanders? I'm not saying that Bernie is the be-all, end-all of a movement. I've always said that these politicians are kind of mascots. Um, and, and really the idea is what's important and, and the collective, uh, support of the idea is, is I think a, more important than, um, you know, just, um, just the individual that leads it. I think the individual is important, but it, it, in terms of this, it's, it's, uh, it's about the idea. And this is where we are today. So, so if you're wondering why, um, there isn't a bigger police union presence, this is why. Because they levy these attacks against you, and when you become a cop, uh, if you don't, if you don't become the private military force of the establishment and uphold laws uh, to criminalize protests, as we see today, uh, because we because we are seeing that in New Orleans, if you um, critical infrastructure laws is what they are, uh, cops support critical infrastructure laws. If you are if you are going to uphold law and order, in my opinion, you should have the critical thought to sit there and say, hey, this seems to go against the First Amendment. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe this is going down a pretty, um, pretty bad path here. Right. Maybe criminalizing protesters uh, for saying that this pipeline is going to leak into a clean water supply or into the soil um, or into a nature preserve or into cities itself, maybe we should listen. So I think if you're a cop and you believe in true law and order um, and you believe in this this notion of freedom and in, in, in this notion of, um, of the Constitution and, and, and being you know, a protector of the public, 
uh, then you should go against laws like that. And you should be able to, you should be allowed to, one, unionize. Because that just means then you're part of the people. Um, and you will take, uh, take the side of people over the establishment. Uh, but two, I think you should have the foresight to look at a law and say that it's illogical. I think that should be the right of um, the police uh, in an ideal world. Um, and I've talked about this several times as well. I, I, I wrote a whole big piece about it, and I've talked about it in my stand-up a couple times. I'll probably talk about it in my stand-up again um, with more, you know, this information involved. Uh, that cops are traumatized. They have PTSD from just being cops themselves because the only thing they see is um, sort of the shitty end of humanity. You know, after the eighth person pisses on your shoe, you think everybody wants to piss on your shoe. And um, I'm not justifying the behavior or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm more recognizing where it comes from, right? Um, if cops are have PTSD just from the general notion of being cops, maybe we should fundamentally change that system. Maybe there's a lot of things within that system itself uh, that once again, if you're going to treat cops like people, if you're going to uh, grant them the human rights that they deserve to be granted, uh, maybe the system should change. Maybe we should be fighting back for the system. And the reason why cops don't is because of what happened here in the 1919 uh, Boston police strike. Um, you know, you, you, you look at you look at the way the media just treated them, where they, where they were in support of them. Four out of five, 80 percent of the media in Boston was in support of them. And then the day of the, the day after the strike, they start uh, putting out the, the red baiting and the uh, uh, and the lies about them. So, you know, it, if you want to know why cops aren't uh, on the side of the people, here's why. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate, but but th uh, this this strike was an unfortunate loss uh, for the people. But but we made some pretty important stands, and there's there's a lot of major lessons that we can learn uh, from all this. Uh, one of them being that a Democratic president and a Republican governor that eventually becomes the president were you know basically in line and thought the same way, which shatters that illusion of the two party system being so different. Um, so yeah. All right. That is, that is the Boston police strike. Um, I do see there's one comment, but it, um, and, and it's, it's from an old high school teacher of mine that I'm very excited to tunes into these things. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> if you don't know, these live videos do end up, um, uh, uh, being posted to my page and then I chop them up too. So like individually, like, let's say you're not particularly interested in one of the topics, um, uh, and you don't really give a shit about like the gospel of Judas or whatever. And you just wanted to tune into the, the to the, uh, Boston police strike thing. I, I chop them up into individual segments and put them up as well. So, so you'll be able to, um, check out the individual, uh, segment as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, like I said, you can leave a comment and we'll throw it up on the screen and, and, and have a conversation about it as well. So uh, if you do have comments, uh, please feel free to, to leave them. Uh, and at the end of each segment, we will we will take a look at them. So uh, let's head on to our final story of the day. Um, and um, and and rock through that. Let's see here. Let's change the banner. Hey, Bo, how's it going? Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I'm I'm glad that you're you're enjoying the enjoying the comment. There's more to come. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about Edward Snowden, who um, did an interview with uh, Vice. Uh, not a huge fan of Vice, by the way. I'm not a big Vice guy. Uh, you know, they've 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 kind of turned into the broy wing of the um, uh, american war propaganda <laughs> like that's kind of what they are they have like a bunch of corporate corporate warmongering shit um that they that they throw up there i'm not a huge fan of them so i kind of take it with a grain of salt but they do but they are the ones that kind of like they you know they have interviews with fucking um, edward snowden they have interviews with alternative journalists they bring in these different perspectives um, sometimes they skew them. Sometimes they give them an honest shake. 
with this interview, I do feel like uh, they gave Edward Snowden an honest shake. They gave him an opportunity to really um, uh, talk about uh, talk about something that I don't think you will hear in corporate media. And I've listened to a bunch of stuff from Edward Snowden. I like Edward Snowden. I, I don't know how you feel about him or, uh, or what your personal opinions on, on Snowden are. Uh, I think he did the right thing. Um, I think that should have probably... Um, push for a real transformation um, in in uh, how the intelligence community surveils the public and uh, whether what they're doing is the right thing or not. But what ended up happening is the public was still pacified by it. We got into this debate of, uh, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, then you shouldn't have any worried about being spying, you know, being spied on, even though it goes against uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, it, it takes away privacy, it creates mental health issues. Uh, when when you don't have a moment to to yourself to to be private, um, you know we've we've kind of paid into the panopticon at this point. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the term panopticon, I like that term a lot. Uh, I <laughs> uh, the first time I heard it was was Glenn Greenwald who talked about it. Uh, he talks about this panopticon idea a whole lot, which is basically um, I believe it comes from fiction. Maybe Jeremy Bentham talked about it, but basically it's this huge tower in a prison community and you never know um, who's in that tower and this obelisk can basically view every segment of the, the prison community and you never know who's in there uh, because you can't see in, but it can always look out, um, right? So in, in our case with, with the, the intelligence community, we can never peek into that camera right? This camera right here that we're looking into, we can't see who's on the other side of it, uh, but you can look right into me, you know? So um, a couple couple different ways to kind of look at that is um, one is to say, well, fuck it. You know, they're, they're, they're spying on us anyway. You know, they're keeping tabs on us anyway, right? Like Facebook won't allow you to post certain content or it will suppress certain content. Uh, Twitter does the same thing. YouTube does. So fuck it. Why not just say what you want to say and find a way to get the message out? Uh, because you know they're watching anyway, right? So why curtail your behavior regardless? Uh, and other people are like, no, we should curtail our behavior because that's the right thing to do. We shouldn't have this kind of unwavering freedom to be ourselves. We shouldn't be, we, we should kind of be restrained. And, and this is a good thing. Besides, if you're not doing anything wrong, what's the harm? Right. What's the harm? So here's the harm. This is uh, this is what uh, Edward Snowden is talking about. He's he's warning us that we're we're on the precipice um, of uh, of authoritarianism uh, that might be coming in the wave of the future. So um, one of the ways that we're dealing with this pandemic right now is a method called contact tracing. And I was mildly familiar with this before, like when everybody was kind of talking about it. I was mildly familiar with this idea of contact tracing. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I recused myself from talking about it because I didn't fully understand what exactly it was. I knew Korea did it. Um, I knew Taiwan and uh, China did it. I think they're, they're talking about using it in the UK. I think they're talking about using it in uh, a, a majority of European countries. And I think they're, they're, they're attempting to talk about it in the States as well. And I'll get to that in just a moment here. Um, contact tracing is basically the idea that you use telecom services and cell phones um, to find out who you had contact with in, in, um, in terms of COVID, right? So let's say you go in, you get a test, you test positive, then they basically use your cell phone data and a bunch of telecom data uh, to find out that you had contact with uh, this person, this person, this person, this person. They get all of their phone number information and they basically send out a test to be like, hey, you've come into contact with somebody that is tested positive. Um, you should go and get tested and probably quarantine yourself. This is what they did um, in uh, uh, Korea and, and uh, in South Korea, in Taiwan and China and stuff like that. Um, and they're and they're also giving it a, a, a try in in uh, a bunch of European countries as well. Now, <laughs> positives and negatives, right? Like, how are we going to contain this thing? How are we going to how are we going to know who has this thing? Especially when uh, it's asymptomatic, 
people don't show symptoms, but they still have the virus. That's pretty, um, pretty scary to people, right? And it, and and it is, you know, there's some there's some nervousness that can come out of it, uh, but it gives uh, governments and intelligence agencies access to your location. It gives them access to contacts. It gives them access directly into your phone, so they can just send you shit, you know. And and it gives them access to trace where you're going um and and it traces the phone itself uh so the the uh, the equivalency that um that they make in this vice interview is um that the the cell phone itself kind of becomes um like an ankle bracelet so the way they kind of operate it in these other countries is um uh, you have a you have a a, a a radius that you can travel from outside your house, right? So you can only go, you know, um, 200 meters away from your residence. Um, and if you go beyond that, then the cops are going to show up and haul you away or whatever, whatever the rule is in whatever country, um, you know, this thing is being applied in. And uh, uh, the notion of trust comes into, comes into play here is because, yes, you want... Um, you want people to uh, be safe. You want us to figure out who has this thing, who needs to be quarantined, who needs any kind of medication, who needs help, who needs to be taken care of in the system, right? Um, and that information is important. Um, but the trust comes into what are you going to do with all this information when we're when we're done with this? You know, is it going to be locked away in some sort of um, emergency reserve? in saying, you know, when, when the next wave of this pandemic or the new, or, or the next pandemic hits, we'll have a plan now. We'll have a way to use this contact tracing to uh, find who has it, who doesn't, and we'll be, we'll be able to take care of this thing faster. But that's never the case, right? Um, a la Patriot Act. Um, Patriot Act was supposed to be, um, basically we gave up a bunch of our freedoms because we were all scared of terrorism. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it created this cycle of xenophobia and the cycle of racism and the cycle of, uh, of just hating each other all the time. Um, but the Patriot Act never went away. We just started engaging in more wars and saying more and more terrorism, that there's new forms of threats. Um, and the Patriot Act just transformed into being something different all the time, right? It just, it just evolved into 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 various different practices of giving up your rights and authoritarianism it just it just evolved into something different it's like the only form of evolution that the government actually believes in is evolving authoritarian principles so you know can we sit there and say um that the government well, you only use this for emergency purposes when there isn't any sort of um, any sort of previous pattern or example to prove that that's actually what's going to happen. We'd never see them do that. Anytime they're like, this is for your safety, this is for your health and safety, so we're going to ask you to give um, amendments one, two, four, eight, uh, and let's just go ahead and say uh, t uh, 12. We're just going to ask you to give up those amendments, and then you'll be safe. And we'll give those amendments back to you. But then they just go, well, we're going to give you 12 back. But the other ones we kind of got to keep because, you know, things are still kind of scary. There's still fear out there. So they keep using this thing, and people sit there and keep going, okay, yeah, it's probably what we need to do here. You know, these authoritarian toolkits have been passed down from, from president to president, leadership to leadership, right? It went from Bush to Obama, and Obama expanded drone warfare and created more wars out of, out of what Bush set up under the Patriot Act, being able to do that sort of stuff. And then he expanded this, the surveillance program with what happened with NSA, with what Edward Snowden revealed, right? And all of that got handed over to Donald Trump. And now Donald Trump is doing... Um, what 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 he wants to do with it uh and who who else is it going to go to you know it, it, even if we get the next four years of trump it's just trump has it, control of it and then he'll hand it over to to who to the next biden 
to the next neoliberal that's put into put in charge that's just going to hand that shit over right to the to the intelligence communities like the CIA or the NSA and now we're setting up a new infrastructure where we're giving up our our fourth amendment rights where we where we're giving up this 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 contact tracing thing where we give up our 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 you know telecommunications rights where they can watch where we're going they don't trust us, so why should we trust them? It's not a mutual thing. Um, in the States right now, uh, Apple and Google said that they would have apps, uh, but it's on an opt-in basis. It's on an opt-in basis. Uh, who the fuck is going to opt into that? <laughs> I'm sure there's some of you out there. Right. I'm sure there's a couple of you that are like, well, we got to do something. We got to opt into it so that there's this data, you know, all this, that there's all these problems with these numbers coming out of China, these numbers coming out of Europe and, and, and even America itself. These are, you know, uh, only information about people that have, uh, have actually shown symptoms, but this is asymptomatic. We need to know. We need to know who's got it. We need to know who's got the antibodies. We need to. So I get it. Where's the guarantee that this won't be used? Again, and uh, you know, unless we're in another pandemic, where where is the assurance of that? We've never seen um, any sort of government give us an assurance for that, right? And and this this is going to create more divide. So you have this opt in issue, right? So there's going to be a bunch of us that are going to go, no fucking way, get the fuck out of here, Are you crazy? There's no way I'm going to do that. There's no way I'm giving up my freedoms. You know, you're going to have a bunch of libertarians that are going to sit there and be like, no, it's my personal choice, my personal freedom. Go fuck yourself. You know, even me, I, I, I don't really particularly want to do that. I, I, you know, I have to use Google Maps um, that gives away my location, and I'm mildly uncomfortable leaving that location sensor on. Um, you know, so I would be hesitant on opting into this. So it's going to create more divide because then you have a bunch of other people that are like, no, you should 100% opt in because it's about the health and safety of the community at large. And, and then now people will start arguing with each other. And, and this creates more divide within, within the average working class people, right? Um, that's, that's, what, that's what it's meant to do. Look at this mask situation that we're seeing, um, you know, where everybody's got to wear masks when they go outside. And, and they're like, we recommend, we recommend it. We're not making it happen we're just going to recommend it. We're just going to say that we highly suggest that if you step outside, you should wear a mask. And even like my mom uh, in the building that, that, that you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm staying in with them. There's a lot of older folks that live in this building. Um, and, um, you know, just to go get the mail, my mom was yelled at yesterday by this old, old bitty, you know, that because my mom wasn't wearing a mask and, um, now there's reports coming out saying you should be wearing a mask inside your own home, that you should be staying six feet away from your parents. Just like I say the fuck away from my parents. <laughs> that's the general. Um, but you know, how far is this going to go? And that's just masks. That's just masks. We're taking it out on each other over masks, over people, you know, not covering their noses and stuff in public because some people are like, well, this seems kind of ridiculous. Besides, the mask should be going to healthcare workers. It should be going to uh, grocery store um, employees and and these gig economy people. They should be receiving as much masks as we, as they need um, because they're the frontline workers. And even and then that becomes a different debate. And all we do is argue and fight amongst each other. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, what's Apple losing? What's Google losing? What's the NSA or the CIA losing? Not a whole lot. They still just end up making up more money to, to, to save these people while we're arguing amongst each other and keeping ourselves uh, in economic poverty. So we need to be, you know, watching for all this stuff because this is, uh, this is a dangerous precipice that we're in. And if we don't ask for accountability, if we don't keep these intelligence communities in check, if we don't keep these government organizations in check, we're going to slip slide right into authoritarianism. Because right now what we are is that we are the frog in the pot, right? We're, we're kind of in, in a pot. We're, we're that frog and we're swimming in the water and we feel real good about it. Um, but, but the authoritarians... Uh, have turned up the heat. 
just a little by little, they'll turn up the heat. You know, and the water starts to get a little bit hotter, a little bit hotter. We don't really feel that heat until it's a little bit too late and we're cooking in it. And we're cooking in it. We just thought we were having a nice swim and now we're roasting alive. That's what we're being right now. We're the frog in that pot. What we should do is go, wait a minute, things are getting a little bit warmer here. Things are getting, I don't remember the water being as warm as it was. What the fuck's going on? Uh-oh, it's, it's still getting warmer. I got to get out of this pot. So we got to keep an eye on that sort of stuff. We got to ask these questions. In a situation like this, you know, um, I think it's, I think we can say that it's opportunistic. Um, I'm sure there are others that will say this is exactly what this pandemic was set up to do. Uh, there are reports that Bill and Melinda Gates and a bunch of other rich people were talking specifically about a pandemic like this in 2017, 2018, uh, something along those lines. Um, and perhaps that's what it was. Perhaps it was set up specifically to, uh, you know, create the pandemic, create a fear cycle and set up another event where we would give up a majority of our freedoms using the technology that everybody has, right? Which is our cell phones, which is the smartphone that we have that we carry around all over the place constantly over and over again. Um, so maybe that's, that's what's going on. Maybe that was the whole plan to begin with that. If, if this, this pandemic was created uh, in a lab or whatever it was, if that, if that ends up being proven to be absolutely 100% true and this was all created, this was the whole thing was manufactured so that we would give them consent to take away our freedoms so that they could constantly track us so that they couldn't build it. So, so, so that no resistance can actually be built so that, you know, we, we slowly give up our, um, our freedoms willingly out of fear. And fear is a very powerful emotion and it's exploited it's taken over pretty consistently. So my, my, you know, my thought in all this is regardless of which aspect of this is true, whether it's opportunism, whether this is manufacturing consent to take our freedoms away and walk us into authoritarianism willingly, um, think critically, ask your questions, question the motives of these people, questions the motives of these corporations. Why do they want us to do this? Are they, and where is the guarantee that at the end of all this, uh, that when this pandemic is over, that they are not storing our data and using it for their own purposes, for their own needs, willy nilly, whenever they want, where's the guarantee of that? That is the, um, that is what I think we should be, we should be paying attention to. That's why critical thinking is so important. That's why skepticism is so important. Asking the right questions. That's why we should be, um, we should be a society that thinks more than just willingly turns the keys over just because somebody belongs to a particular party or a particular organization. Um, we should be encouraged to have these conversations in our society and not be chastised for wanting to have these conversations. So for, for wanting to question certain things, for wanting to say, I wonder what the logic and reason behind all this stuff is. Um, so, so I hope that, uh, uh, that you will, you will do that going forward. Uh, and that is, that is our live stream, everybody. Uh, I feel like these are getting long. Um, I hope you guys don't mind how long these get. Some of you stick around from start to finish and I fucking love you for it. Uh, cause you guys are troopers. Um, and, uh, uh, you guys are all fucking amazing. Uh, thank you guys for, for hanging out with me today. Um, we will be back tomorrow uh, with more videos. Uh, like I said, we'll be going live every single Sunday. There's an event page uh, that I have set up. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the news with, with uh, live events right now is uh, I'm not going to be performing live stand-up comedy in any sort of venue or public spot. Um, you know, till this thing is over and it's looking like I'm going to lose, um, May as well. I'm going to have to cancel all of the May shows and reschedule them for a later date. I'm not sure when that date is going to be. 
Um, you know, people still aren't booking. We're, we're still not sure when the fuck we're going to get out of all this stuff. Uh, but I am working on creating um, a uh, somewhat of a live event, like an E stand up comedy event via Zoom. I'm going to try to work on that this week, actually. Uh, put together some kind of a show, find out what format is going to work best. Maybe I'll, I'll, you know, create a more structured version of some of the stuff that we're talking about, um, you know, in, in, in the, these videos here, um, I'm going to run a test show, which will be, which will kind of be like, just like a free show with, with a very small audience, figure out the kinks, figure out how to record it, uh, and maybe, maybe start releasing them. Um, maybe first to Patreon members, then, you know, to the general, general public itself, um, or sustaining members, however it is. Um, but, um, uh, but I, but I'm going to try to sort that out. I'm going to try to sort that out. I need to learn, I need to learn some new technologies, uh, to do that. So that is the plan right now. Uh, so, you know, by the end of all this, if we are back in, if we're back in action by, like mid June, um, I would have essentially lost three straight months of, of <laughs> work, which is so crazy. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, not give you guys a, a, a live stand up show. I know these are these are these are fun conversations to have, and I really appreciate all the people that that tune into all this stuff. But this is this is not the experience of a live stand up comedy show. I, I do love doing them. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there is something about, you know, performing fucking live, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the exhilaration of that is just fucking great. So, um, thank you guys. Uh, again, uh, please share this out. Um, content like this is not going to get shown to as many people. This is, this is a subversive content. So, um, you know, they don't, they don't kind of show this out. So I, I really depend on people helping me out as much as they can, uh, to, um, to, to share the content uh, and and get the word out to as many people as possible. Uh, and as always, my final bit of thing is it is never a, a requirement, uh, but if you can, if you have the ability to, any donation that you make is greatly helpful uh, in these troubling times. But I understand that we're all in, uh, in, in troubling times. So, uh, it is not a requirement. If you can become a sustaining member, that's awesome. If you can make a one-time donation, that's also awesome. A lot of you have already become sustaining members, already become, um, made, made these donations. And I really, really appreciate that. And I really, really, uh, love you guys for it. It, it you have no idea how much it, it, it actually does help. Um, I'm going to be updating some of the stuff on the Patreon and, in terms of goals uh, that you guys are uh, that you guys would be supporting, because uh, some of the financial situations have changed um, in clearly <laughs> in the last couple of weeks, uh, based on that Spotify censorship, based on just the arrangement that I'm uh, currently in, and, and I'm looking to to move forward with. Uh, so, if you have the ability to, uh, that'd be great. If you, it, but but it's not a requirement. Seriously. Um, I also have a lot of merch uh, for sale as well, uh, CDs primarily. And if you go to my Bandcamp page, they're available as pay what you want, uh, which basically means that they're available for free. Uh, that's that's virtually what that means. So if you can't make a contribution, but you still want to enjoy some stand-up content, if you if you enjoy the conversations that we're having and you want to hear it in a more structured stand-up comedy format, um, they are available right now for pay what you want, so you can download them absolutely for free from my Bandcamp page, uh, which is which all of that links is directly from my website, um, and uh, and I also have T-shirts. People ask me for T-shirts. I hate carrying T-shirts when I do live shows. Um, so I, I have them online. They're available on a Teespring page. Um, and, uh, maybe I'll link them in the live stream. Maybe I'll, I'll put, I'll put links to all this in the live stream, uh, towards the end here. Uh, but, uh, if, if they're a little bit too expensive, um, let me know. And I have a discount code that I can offer you. Um, or I can give you a, a, another code that'll just basically give it to you for free. I think I can do that. Um, but I'll, I'll sort something out so that if you do want a t-shirt, if you do want to support me in that way, but you're like, Hey, it's a little bit, you know, out of my budget. 
um, I can, you know, send you a code or something um, just because um, I, you know, I just, I, I want you to enjoy it. And, and if you want to sport some Krishware, uh, you can sport some Krishware. Uh, I'm going to be making, I, I designed those things particularly myself too. So uh, I'm going to be trying to get some new designs up there as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, okay. This is, this is, uh, this is a long one. And I, and I love you guys for tuning in. I love you guys for hanging out uh till till tomorrow uh tomorrow will be a brand new episode of the show but till tomorrow thank you guys for tuning in we'll see you on the road